All right, hello everyone. Hello everyone, just give me one second. Let me make sure I uh, have my, uh, let's see. Okay, all right, everyone. Well, thanks for tuning in. My name is Mark. I am the uh, head of the Benzinga Trading School. And today we are gonna talk about some leveraged and inverse ETFs. When the Drexon, Drexon people first asked if I would would do this, it's like, it's, it's to us it's such a no brainer because in the trading school, we talk about these suite, or I guess an offering of ETFs that they have, which are leveraged and inverse. And a lot of people in the retail world don't understand that they can make money when the market is going down. They can use leverage and you don't need to be a sophisticated futures trader or options trader. You can just, the retail investor can take advantage of moves in the market by these ETFs. So one of the things that we want to do today is just show you what's out there and show you that you have a lot of options. Now, just say the market's going to go down, right? A lot of people think like, I have no option, but I just got to go to cash. I got to go just stick my head in the sand and pretend it goes away. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually, in my opinion, you can make money easier in a down market than in an up market because markets go down faster than they go up. And that's because markets go down because people sell and people sell because of fear. Markets go up because people buy. People buy because of hope. Fear is a much stronger emotion for people than hope is. So this makes markets go down faster than they go up. So there are a lot of different things that we can use here. Um, I'll bring on um, Elliot here. But uh, yeah, we're going to talk about a bunch of pretty cool ideas that we can apply to the market in real time. I mean, I know it's a Saturday. I know the market's not open now, but we could just talk about how to let the market tell us what to do and how to get exposure and how to pretty much make money in any kind of a market. I mean, up, down, sideways, there's always ways to profit. And these ETFs from Trexon are really kind of a phenomenal way to do it. So I'll bring on Elliot now. Hey, Mark. Uh, yeah, no, uh, excited to be here today. Thank you for having me. And thank you to Ben Zinga. Um, and, you know, just, uh, Quick introduction. Uh, I know Mark already mentioned it. Um, I'm a, a senior vice president over at Direction, working on our institutional strategy. Um, and uh, you know, for those that uh, are unfamiliar today about Direction, you're going to get to learn a lot more about it, and just in general, more of uh, the leverage and inverse uh, ETF space. Um, so very excited to be here. All right, let me just show you how can I get. I want to get my chart up here and I have to share it. Okay, there we go. Cool, cool, cool. All right. How about that? <laughs> All right, I'm just going to give you, a, just to really kind of start off here, one of the things I teach in the trading school is this. I, I've been around the block a few times. I was fortunate enough that I started my trading career with Mario Gabelli. Um, I traded for Steve Cohen, who is the guy who owns the Mets now. People always say, oh, is the show Billions realistic? I mean, I've never seen Billions, but supposedly it's based on uh, Steve. So one of the things I've learned over the years is that the best traders really don't, they, they have kind of a reactionary mindset. They don't show up to work every day saying, here's what I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to do. What they do is they show up to work and they say, what is the market telling me? Okay. Now, one of the things that is pretty interesting, which I've kind of um, been paying attention to. And in the trading school, we go over this. We go over, you know, we go through these sectors. There's 11 different sectors in the market. Now, most of the time, well, tech gets all of the uh, attention, but there are other sectors too. Now, this is our financial sector, okay? So this is the second biggest sector in the market, all right? Now, notice how it got up to this price level here, which was resistance back here in January of 22. A lot of times when markets get to former peaks, they 
find resistance. Why? Well, there's people who bought at the peak back here who have been underwater ever since. And I know this is a hard concept, but the charts don't lie. It's called market memory. These are the levels that are important, can retain their importance for a long time. But we have these people who are trying to get out of break even. Now, the next dynamic when you get to a resistance level is you have all these sellers, right? Sometimes the sellers start to start to think like, gee, there must be other sellers coming into the marketer and they start to get worried. They can tell the price isn't going higher anymore. So therefore they assume there are new sellers coming into the market. So in this situation here, this sets us up for a reversal in the financials. Now, how do you play that? You're like, yeah, Mark, that sounds great. Blah, 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 blah. What am I supposed to do? I don't trade options. I don't trade futures. Well, we can go and we can look right over here. One of our favorite ETFs is the FAS. Okay. This is designed to move in the opposite direction of financials by three times as much. So this is what we would call an inverse leveraged ETF. So if that financial sector I just showed you goes down, say, 2%, this thing is going to skyrocket and be up by about 6%. So this is a way that retail investors can get exposure to these different things. Now, if you're an options trader, you can really get the kind of the double whammy if you're on the right side of the market because you could buy options on something that is leveraged. So options are leveraged and you're buying an option or you're using leverage to buy something that's leveraged. All right. I, I know I'm going to get there at some point. Um, but yeah, so anyway, these things are really, really cool. And uh, they've been a big help to a lot of the students in our class. Now, I know everyone's probably like, okay, NVIDIA this, AI stock that, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's all anyone's really talking about these days. But like I said, there are other parts of the market. Well, guess what? If you like NVIDIA and you think NVIDIA is going to go higher, well, why would you just buy the stock? You could buy the Drexen NVDU ETF, which is designed to move in the same direction as as uh nvidia but by 50 percent more so in other words if one day nvidia is up by two percent this will be up by say three percent okay so it's a it's a way you can get more bang for your buck now if you're someone who doesn't short and you're someone who doesn't buy options and you think nvidia is going down all right don't everyone send me hate email i know everyone's in videos you know blah 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 <laughs> you know, I know here it's coming. Okay, it's you know it's just a stock, everybody. But anyway, all kidding aside, if you think Nvidia is going to go down, you could buy the NVDD, which is designed to move in the opposite way of Nvidia. So if Nvidia goes down two percent, this will be up two percent. So it's a simple. It's, these things are just like buying stocks. It's very simple. There's a, a bunch of really cool ones in here too. There's the gold miners we look at a lot. There's the ways to get exposure from the, uh, in the energy sector. Um, all right. So anyway, now let me just talk about one of the things I just wanted to show you here before we move on. Now, so a lot of our students are talking about, all right, well, is this whole AI thing a bubble? You know, is it going to blow up? So, you know, I mean, my opinion, yes and yes. But I would also say this. Bubbles can go on for a long time. So I don't know. Does it blow up tomorrow? Does it blow up in a year? Does it blow up in five years? I mean, who the hell knows? But this is an ETF that is designed to move in the opposite direction of the semiconductors by three times as much. So if if NVIDIA, AMD, all these things start to head south and you're just wondering how you could profit off of it, this would be a good place to be. But you have to remember, just like anything, right? I mean, if you're on the wrong side of the market, you're going to lose money faster. If you're on the right side of the market, you're going to make money faster. But it's just something that comes with um, with trading. Yeah, I, you know, just to chime in here, I, I think you're, you know, you're talking about some great things with, you know, the capabilities of uh, leverage and inverse ETFs. And, you know, I think it, it might be beneficial actually to, uh, you know, I uh, have a few slides here uh, that just give the basics overview, um, you know, how these work, 
um, because, you know, going over uh, leverage inverse ETFs because, you know, you're, you're bringing up a great thing, um, but they are very specific tools. And, you know, you mentioned before, you can be on the wrong side of the trade. And if you're on the wrong side of the trade with leverage and a few other things, um, you know, really, you know, emphasizing that these are, you know, intended for shorter term tactical trading, um, definitely not buy and hold investments. So, um, you know, uh, I think actually would be, you know, give a, just a brief overview of, you know, how these work and then we can dive in to some of the specific products, exactly what you're talking about. That sounds good. Um, uh, you know, on, uh, you know, looking at, um, you know, uh, actually, uh, yeah, going through this, yeah, quick agenda, you know, um, but on our, on our next uh, slide here, um, this is fun disclosure slide. It wouldn't be, I'm not going to read this, don't worry anybody, um, but it wouldn't be a financial presentation without a nice long disclosure slide. Um, definitely if you want this, uh, this can be available later. Um, we're really looking at the next slide, just a quick overview of, uh, you know, direction, um, you know, who we are as a company. Um, you know, we've been around since 1997. Um, we're located in New York um, and we really specialize in actually what Mark has, uh, you know, talked about and uh, highlight a few of our ETFs. Um, we're a boutique manager um, and specialize in leverage and inverse ETFs. And, um, you know, we have about, you know, 38, uh, for right now, it's closer to 40 billion in assets under management. Um, and just on the next slide, you're going to see uh, just a little overview of the leverage and inverse space, because, you know, I'm sure everybody here is probably familiar with ETFs. Maybe this is a newer concept, leverage and inverse. I'm sure for some, it's not. Um, I'm sure some people have used it. Um, but as you can see, uh, the you know the the entire space of leverage inverse ETFs uh, is a smaller part of the ETF universe, um, but it is a very heavily traded area because of the volatility, because the the products are short term, um, and you can see that you know most of the products tend to and the assets tend to be in the three X. So what, what do I mean by three X? That means a uh, 300% daily exposure to the long side. Um, and just, uh, you know, actually on the, uh, you know, next slide, just kind of a little overview of how leverage and inverse ETF works. So every one of our ETFs, uh, if you've ever seen one or, you know, right on the website uh, that Mark had pointed out, um, it's going to say daily on that. And what does that mean? It means that we're going to provide daily leverage exposure. The bull funds are, you know, long ETFs. That's 2x or 3x, so 200% daily exposure or 300% daily exposure. And then, of course, we have, you know, the inverse side as well. Um, and what does that basically mean is that for every $1 invested, you're either getting 200% or 300% daily exposure. So you're getting this enhanced exposure on a daily basis. Um, what is, you know, the, the terminology leverage comes in. Um, and just a, you know, quick thing of we're using uh, forms of derivatives. Uh, Mark had mentioned, you know, if you are not an options trader um, or a futures trader, you know, those are forms of derivatives that are used to, you know, obtain leverage um, from financial professionals, um, by retail investors, day traders. Um, we use uh, mostly swaps um, for the composure of our ETFs. And just one thing I want to, you know, really highlight is actually on our next slide here is that with leverage and inverse ETFs, I keep bringing up this word daily and, you know, why these are short term trading tools and they're not buy and hold investments. We you know, want to make sure that all uh, potential traders of our products or any leverage, uh, you know, ETF out there or inverse you know, understands that these have a, a daily rebalance. And what does that mean? So that means that we are going to make sure at the end of every trading day, we're going to rebalance the exposure to make sure that you start the next trading day. So, you know, markets close today. Um, so Monday, we're going to make sure that you start out with a 3x, 2x, you know, whatever, in, uh, you know, leverage exposure that, you know, that fund um, is designed to provide on a daily basis. 
that all sounds fine and well, but it's a very important thing to understand with these ETFs because that can lead to compounding effects and also what we call uh, negative compounding effects where, um, you know, if you're in more of a highly volatile market, it can lead to almost a decaying effect, not from the derivative because we're using swaps, um, but from the daily rebalance. So this is just a hypothetical um, you know, example of, I'm just gonna run through this quickly because, and again, um, you know, this is all available on our website, but to show the, the effects of this daily rebalance with leverage and how it can impact the return of a leverage ETF for longer than a single trading day. Um, you know, hypothetically, you're starting out day one with $100 invested, so with a leverage ETF that's 3x, that means you have $300 of exposure starting out day one. Um, let's just say, you know, again, in this scenario, the ETF moves 15% because, you know, make this easy. Let's say the S&P went up 5%. That would be a big move, daily move for the S&P. But um, so in a 3x S&P fund, you'd be up 15%. Your end of day assets is going to be $115. And that means that your end of day exposure is going to be $345. But we're going to have to go out and rebalance that fund. Um, and so we're making sure that you start out day two with um, you know, the correct exposure. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to talk through these boxes, but I think the next slide is a little bit more valuable. Um, just an example. So this is looking at a bull trending market and it sounds corny, but it's very true with our ETFs and all leverage ETFs that trend is your friend. Um, again, it sounds corny, but it's very true. So this example, it's over about a seven day period of, um, you know, you're looking, you see the benchmark. So again, let's just say that's, you know, hypothetically the S and P 500 over a seven day period, um, you know, approximately, um, might be a little bit more on this, um, but the benchmark's up 11.4%. So with our leveraged uh, ETF, because it's rebalancing daily, and because you see an overall underlying trend in that benchmark, that middle orange line, you see the bull fund of ours is up actually slightly more than a 3x return of the benchmark. And that's because, again, the daily rebalance with leverage, you're getting a strong compounding effect and you're getting that trend as your friend um, exposure here. And you can see, you know, a 3x bear fund that's off of the same benchmark. Again, let's just say this is inverse off the S&P 500. You're actually down a little bit less than you would be um, for the cumulative return of the benchmark. So, you know, if you took the wrong side of the trade there, you should be down about 34.2% if you just, you know, multiply the benchmark, you know, 11.4 by three, but because of that daily rebalance, you're down a little bit less, you're down 28.7%. Um, so this is meant to highlight and, you know, explain how the daily rebalance with leverage can impact, you know, your overall uh, return in a trending market environment. So this is all great and well, but I want to show you on the next slide uh, where it is not a good environment. So this is another example, hypothetical, where you see that underlying benchmark, um, you know, moving kind of up and down, but there's really a lack of trend. Um, and you have moves up and down over a multiple day period. And your the benchmark itself is, is returning um, in that period about, um, you know, 2.4%. Um, and then you're going to see the bull ETF. You you would think, okay, 2.4% times three over that period, I should be up 7.2. Actually, the uh, return on that uh, this graph, I'm not sure how to make it in there, is not uh, is not there. But uh, the return in that period is is actually 6.3% for the bull ETF, the one on the top. And the bear ETF in that same scenario is down. So you're up less in the bull ETF than you should be. You know, if you thought again, timesing it by three and in the bear ETF, you're down 8.6%. And again, so you're down more than what you should be. And again, this is meant to highlight where the, the effects of leverage in inverse ETFs with the exposure and with the daily rebalance that you shouldn't expect to see 
a 3x return over a cumulative period longer than a single trading day. Um, and this is, I really wanted to highlight on this slide because this is probably one of the biggest misconceptions with leverage and inverse ETFs is that, you know, they see the, uh, you know, someone will see the benchmark is up 5%, um, you know, let's just say something's up 5% for the year. Um, for a total total year, it's up 5%. You know, theoretically, they think, okay, this is a 3x fund. Um, you know, I should be up 15%. Um, but if the volatility in that year and there was a lack of direction and a lot of volatility, um, that both ETFs could be down in that period. So th that's why I want to highlight this is that these are short term trading tools. They're not buy and hold investments. They do have another you know, degree of risk because of the leverage exposure and also the daily rebounds. And I'm not trying to scare anybody away here. <laughs> I just want to make sure that, you know, the fundamentals, you know, are understood of, you know, how these products work and that they're really strong and powerful tools that can work in your favor, but also need to understand that they are short term trading tools and, and not intended as buy and hold. Um, so that I just really wanted to, Marcus, really wanted to cover that. Um, and I thought it was good to you know, just get a, a basis of, um, you know, how these, how these tools, um, and ETFs work. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think, you know, going there and actually going down just to something we're talking about innovation, going down to our single stock, uh, slides, um, the uh that's you know fairly down the presentation about uh around slide 12. um we go to that yeah so everyone these are the stocks is, is it basically the magnificent seven here oh yeah we'll go down uh, a couple more slides uh yeah so apple amazon google microsoft nvidia tesla there are ways that you can get a little more bang for your buck or if you think it's going to go down you can just get exposure to these that will go up with the stock the underlying stock goes down yeah um yeah moving to the uh single stock slides um one more down or two more down sorry right there perfect so you know something that has come into uh you know the investable etf space um in the us uh more recently uh is our single stock leverage inverse etfs um we're always looking at you know new in innovative ways and different strategies um and uh you know trading tools to provide uh you know potential investors and these actually have been around uh, in Europe for quite some time. Um, and uh, we recently launched a handful of these um, back, uh, majority of them about a little over a year and a half ago, our most recent launch. Uh, and this was about six months ago, our NVIDIA uh, stock. But yeah, this is the Magnificent 7 minus 1 minus Meta. Um, so we offer uh, 1.5 daily exposure um, on the bull side. Um, you know, for all these individual names. And then we also have single inverse uh, ETFs as well to these individual stocks, um, as you can see on the, the far right. Um, and the single inverse is more of, you know, tactical short-term trading or hedging. Um, you know, we've seen a, a big pickup around these, especially around earnings. Um, when these names are reporting earnings, we see definitely a, a significant pickup um, in these uh, single stock names. Um, and there, it's a great way to, uh, you know, tactically trade short term if you're looking for, you know, on the bull side, a little bit more exposure uh, to that name um, to say Apple or Tesla, you know, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, NVIDIA. Um, if you have a you know, short term conviction, this is a great way to you know, trade the long side. Um, or if you're looking to take a short term inverse view, you can also take that with the single inverse. Um, we've actually seen. Tesla, you know, we talk about the Magnificent Seven uh, that, you know, I almost call it the Magnificent Six now, uh, you know, with uh, everything <laughs> that's, that's happening with Tesla. Anymore. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, and we've actually seen uh, our largest uh, inflows, one of the largest inflows across all of our ETFs uh, year to date 
Um, but and it's, uh, the largest for the single stock has actually been the Tesla bull ETF, TSLL, um, the 1.5 long uh, ETF off of Tesla. Um, and it's interesting be, and it's, you know, contrarians taking the view that they think there's going to be, you know, a reversal, um, you know, with Tesla. Um, I mean, we really haven't seen it happen uh, yet. I mean, there's been a lot of head, headline news um, around Tesla um, and, you know, just in general, um, you know, with the most recent report coming out uh, that, you know, they're slowing down uh, their, uh, you know, their uh, production in their Chinese factories. Um, but it's interesting to see that, you know, with Tesla being down so much this year, uh, we've seen, you know, the contrarian view of, you know, looking to uh, trade it short term on a short term bounce with the, the long ETF of ours, um, uh, TSLL. Um, but sorry, Mark, uh, I, I want to, uh, you know, let you talk about these as well. Yeah, I mean, these are really great tools. And I think going uh, talking about Tesla in China is kind of an interesting segue because there are these international funds. Uh, Brazil, uh, I, I, I'm not recommending any of these, but I'm just trying to make you aware that you can get exposure to all these things that you probably never even realized. So whatever your opinion is on what's going on over there in China, there's a ETF that you can uh, get exposure. Now, in the energy world over here, oil has been really kind of moving higher. Um, oil has been kind of breaking out. So I'm just going to bring up a chart here of oil. All right. This is your classic, what we would call the ascending triangle pattern in the technical analysis world. And what this means is that there were buy, uh, sellers who were willing to hang out and they were patient around 78.50. That's why we have this horizontal resistance level. But at the same time, notice how you have this ascending line on the bottom here, which is the name where the name ascending triangle comes from. But when we look at a chart, we have to understand we're looking at the psychology of the people that are doing the trading, right? People overthink charts way too much and they give chart analysis a bad name. Just think about this. The sellers are chill and they're like, hey, whatever, you come to me, I'll sell. If not, not a big deal. But as time is going by, by, the buyers are getting more aggressive. That's why the valleys form at a higher level than the previous valley. Markets go in peaks and valleys. And if the valley is higher than the previous valley, we call that a, a lower high. And this tends to lead to a breakout. Now, okay, so if we go over Trexon, guess what? We have energy ETFs. So basically, if oil keeps moving higher, the energy sector is going to move higher. I mean, I know there's other things going on in the energy sector, but oil is, at the end of the day, the biggest inf influencer. Now, if you think oil is going to keep moving higher, okay, ERX. This is going to move in the same direction and, as, and in the same direction as the energy sector, but by about twice as much. And as Elliot pointed out very clearly, these are really more vehicles for short-term traders. This isn't something that you would say, well, you know, I think there's going to be a change in the administration and it's going to do this to the energy policy. So this is something I'm going to buy for then hold on to three or four years. These are more um, trading instruments, uh, but they are very cool. So, and, so, you know, there's my great analysis. Oh, they're cool, right? <laughs> All those years I went to business school. Um Look at this. Now, this is another thing that our students trade a lot is the exposure to gold. You got the nugget. I love who comes up with these names, Elliot. That would be one of my yeah. I mean, the symbol. <laughs> no, no, I know. We uh, we always <laughs> get the uh, the question of, uh, you know, even if people aren't trading and they say you guys have amazing symbols. Um, you know, it's, it's done by, uh, by direct employees. So, you know, we're trying to, you know, find something that, uh, you know, and, and you, what you're on right now, Nugget and Dust are, and then J Nug, J Dust, um, are, you know, some of our iconic, uh, you know, ETFs that historically, um, you know, have a lot of volatility, um, and people love, um, but it's, it's where we create them in house. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're always looking for, you know, not only a catchy symbol, but uh, something that uh, directly relates to what it, uh, you know, what you're investing in. So, you know, nugget, you know, you got a nugget of gold or, you know, the inverse side dust, your, your, you know, gold turns to dust, you're taking the inverse view. And you got gush and drip too. So this is another way to get exposure.
to energy. So we talked about ERX and ERY. Well, these are a play on the sector, okay? The ener energy is a sector. Within the sector, there are various industries. And an industry within the energy sector is the oil and gas exploration uh, industry. So we follow that. Um, we follow that here, but to trade off of it though, like this is kind of just the, I, I guess like the, I don't know, the, the plan, the map, but when you want to get the exposure, you can come over here because you know what, if you're, you shouldn't take a position unless you think you're right. All right. I mean, that's, I know that sounds pretty damn self-evident, but I talk to people all the time. It's like, Hey, why'd you buy that? Well, <laughs> it's like talking to one of my kids. Like, hey, <laughs> where are you going later? You know, and sometimes they give you that. You can't tell if it's a yes or a no. It's like, you know, yeah, this is. A... But anyway, <laughs> if you're confident in an idea, say you think gold is going to go up, all right? You want to buy gold. Well, you can buy gold and you can have them deliver it to your house. And then the, you know, the cousin of the delivery man comes and robs you the next night. You can, or you can go and get exposure from one of these ETFs. Now, if gold is going to go up by, say, 3%, the gold miners index is going to go up by more. So if you're on the right side of the trade and you think you want to be long gold, well, it, it just goes without saying, well, here's a way to get more exposure to it. If you're, if you're, one of the things about trading is say you're right about an idea. Okay. I think gold is going to go higher. What's the best way to utilize your funds? What's the best bang for your buck? But in the institutional world, we would call this like capital allocation. What's the best way to allocate your capital? Because if you're right, gold is going to do this. Well, gold does that, but there are going to be gold miners that maybe go up even more. They're going to be gold mining ETFs that go up anymore. Now, the thing about the gold miners, I used to have a good friend who was a really hardcore gold miner analyst, and he would go down to South America like once every six months, and he would go check out these mines. The problem is a lot of these little miners are like these one-hit wonders. If there's a labor problem or if something breaks down, it's it's you know it's all over. But by going into the ETFs, you can get the exposure to gold without having to worry about the individual risk of a particular company. Yeah. So, you know, also, one, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say one thing, uh, you know, uh, and I, I, you actually already, you know, covered it, but you know, want to uh, make clear as well as that, you know, you're looking at gold. Um, we're looking at the gold miners. So, you know, Nugget, JNUG um, are, you know, gold miners and junior gold miners. And then, um, you know, the inverse side of those dust uh, JDST as well. They're on the gold mining stocks. You know, uh, of course, gold is going to have, uh, you know, an impact on because that's their, their primary business. Um, but, you know, we always we do see sometimes, you know, some questions of, hey, I saw gold go up this much today. Um, but uh, you know, Nugget or JNUG, um, you know, our gold miner 2X ETFs, um, they didn't go up in tandem, you know, with the move on gold and it was different. Um, so we always want to, you know, make sure, you know, people understand that, you know, this, these are equities at the end of the day. Um, they're, you know, but they're in the specific sector of, you know, gold mining and they're gold mining stocks. Um, yeah. So and and a lot, there. a lot, a, a lot of times there's a disconnect because when, you you look at a future like say gold it trades 24 hours a day seven days a week and if you're looking at something like this j dust it trades from 9 30 to 4 eastern time so it all depends on what service you're looking at um like well gee gold is done x but why is this only done that well because we're measuring gold from midnight eastern time last night whereas we're measuring this from 9 30 eastern time so it's just something to be aware of, but it, it's nothing that should frighten uh, people off. All right, so robotics, right? There's a really cool one. What's called like U-Bot or R-Bot? Uh, U-Bot. U-Bot. Uh, 
Yes, uh, Ubot <laughs> is um, it's our daily uh, you know, 2x uh, robotics uh, and AI uh, 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 play. Yeah, so again, there's just, I, I think the, the main thing that I want to convey that I tell my students, and, and, you know, I have students of all different caliber. Most of them, though, are in the Benzinga Trading School are, are newer people coming in, and we really don't care. I mean, all like, as long as you want to learn, that's all that really matters. But a big part of the learning process is understanding that you have these ability to make money if the market's going down or to make even more money if the market's going the right way that that you thought now it's i guess what i'm trying to, to say is that if you put on your financial networks or your whatever your you know run the mill regurgitation oh like when the market was really falling apart back in early 2022 the mantra was like go to cash go to cash go to cash go to cash guess what we had students i we had students that made more money than they had ever made before in that market because like i said when markets go down i think it's easier to make money because they go down faster than they go up so by just knowing that you have this ability to just go buy a particular etf just like it's a stock i mean i know there's some complicated stuff going on behind the scenes there but for your everyday retail trader you don't need to worry about that it's just like buying an etf of course you have to worry or not worry but keep in mind the things that elliot has been speaking about with the leverage and the and the closing processes and so forth but i mean look at this go i look at the go to <laughs> daily travel and vacation yeah and then uh, your oto <laughs> out of yeah pockets. now we can come over here into the fixed income world what is everyone talking about right interest rates interest rates blah 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 no one talked about interest rates for well just to kind of date myself all right my first real trading job was back in the mid 90s and it's like for all those years no one ever really talked about interest rates and then all of a sudden in the past couple of years that's all we talk about but guess what interest rates go higher what does that do to bonds bonds go down interest rates go lower bonds go up so right here, using these ETFs, you have a, the ability as a regular retail trader, I'm not diminishing it or anything by that standard or by such means, but you have the ability that, you know what, I think interest rates are going to go up. Okay, so this kind of isn't that good. My bills are going to go up. My payments are going to go up. What am I supposed to do? Well, if interest rates are going to go up, guess what? Bonds are going to go down and you could go buy the ETF that is going to go in the opposite direction. So there's your play to make money off interest rates. So interest rates go up, bonds go down. Interest rates go down, bonds go up. So we have the 20-year bull 3X and we have the 20-year treasury bear uh, 3X. We have the same thing. I, I'm... Most people tend to focus on a 10-year, um, but for the shorter term, you have have these, right? Then we talked about international, we have Mexico. Really amazing. I mean, I, like this stuff really, you know, this stuff didn't exist when I first came up. It's back then in those days, if you thought the market was going down, unless you were some sophisticated trader, it's like your only option was go to cash. How about the whole thing with the, the flight to safety? Oh, everyone thinks the market's going to, go blow up we're going to just go jump into gold right well flight to safety you can start looking at some of these things that are going to move more so remember a big part of trading is not just being right a big part of trading is understanding the most efficient way to allocate your capital all right in the institutional world there are risk managers and traders that literally like this is their job okay we've made this decision that we think gold is going to go up all right what's the best way to go play it? if we're right what's the best way to figure this out now look at this the healthcare uh healthcare is at an interesting level here all right the healthcare sector now notice how we we found support here for i don't know last two and a half months 
there tends to be support at levels that were support before. And this happens because of psychology. There are people who sold who, when the market went up the next day, they're like, oh, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have sold. If it gets back to my price and I can buy my shares back at the same price I sold them at, I'm going to. A lot of times when you get to a support level, well, the buyers start to sense, oh, other buyers are coming into the market here. So I better go increase the bid I'm willing to pay because the sellers are going to go to whoever's willing to pay the highest price. So you tend to get rallies off of that. Now, what's a way to play that? Well, we can go over to the Cure ETF. This is an ETF that is designed to move in the same direction as this by about three times as much. So if you're right that there's going to be a technical bounce in healthcare, well, you can get more, you would have a better bang for your buck here. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, uh, even going back to um, what you're talking about with the Treasury uh, ETFs, uh, yeah, TMF, uh, TMV, uh, I think if you go up, uh, maybe it's uh, a little further up. Um, uh, yeah, right there. Um, you know, just circle back and you mentioned uh, interest rates, you know, have been, you know, the topic of, uh, you know, every financial news network, uh, you know, everybody's talking about it, um, especially, you know, for the past, what, almost two years now, um, you know, especially around uh, the Fed meeting uh, this past week, um, no surprise, no change. Um, but we did see, you know, rates move, uh, well, the treasuries move, um, you know, off of, you uh, you know, Powell's speech, um, you know, giving, you know, what traders are looking at for rhetoric around, you know, their kind of perception of, you know, are rate cuts going to come quicker um, or are we going to stay higher for longer? And so, you know, like uh, like Mark mentioned, you know, our you know 20 plus year treasury bull and bear TMF, TMV, um, you know, are great ways to play that. And if you're looking for the shorter end of the curve, um, you can do that with, TYD, TYO, um, the seven to 10 year, um, you know, bull and bear ETFs, um, just something, uh, you know, fun stat, you know, I, I mentioned uh, the Tesla or Tesla bull uh, fund that has, you know, Tesla stock has been down significantly this year. And we've seen significant inflows into our bull fund contrarians, um, you know, taking that view that there might be a short term bounce back. We've actually seen that the same with uh, TMF or, you know, our triple leveraged bull fund. And as Mark mentioned, you would think bull fund, if rates go up, I want to go, you know, I want to trade TMF. It's actually because it's an ETF, it's based off the price of the bond, not the yield. So, you know, as Mark already mentioned, if, um, you know, uh, rates are going to go up, then the bond price is going to go down. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for to play that short term, that's TMV, but TMF, um, you know, again, has been down pretty significantly over the the past couple of years um you know and just the 20 plus year treasury um because rates have risen so much tmf is the largest inflows we've seen uh this year into any of our etfs and again it's the contrarians taking a short-term view that you know there's going to be a reversal um in the 20 plus year treasury um and so um, yeah, they're just, uh, you know, some some ways that you can play, um, you know, short term tactical trading to, uh, view um, on, you know, treasuries around rates. Um, and um, yeah. Ellie, can you can you say that again? You said it was the the largest inflows you've ever seen. No, no. The largest inflows out of our suite of uh, we probably have about. 80 somewhere around 80 etfs um and probably about 95 percent of those 99 almost are you know leveraging inverse um it's the largest we've seen this year across our suite not not ever um but the largest oh, okay. across all of our etfs this year have been into the our tmf etf um and you know because contrarians again taking you know the view short-term traders taking the view that there's going to be a reversal Contrarian investing is very interesting, and it's kind of um, it's something we should talk about right now because of this whole environment. Now, look, it doesn't matter how great a company's product is. It doesn't matter what their earnings are going to be. It doesn't matter what the EBITDA is. When the market gets to a place where it runs out of buyers, the only place it can go is down. 
So the famous story, legend story, which is probably true, it's probably happened a million times, but Joe Kennedy, the patriarch of the Kennedy family, was a Wall Street operator back in the 20s, probably their equivalent of what would be a modern day hedge fund manager. And he was on his work, on his way to work one day and he was getting his shoe shined and the shoe shine boys started giving him stock tips. And he went to work and he sold all his stocks and he shorted everything. The market crashed and then the rest is history. So what happened here? Well, Kennedy was thinking, <clears throat> wait, if someone who doesn't typically buy stocks like a shoe shine boy is buying stocks, there's no one left in the food chain to push the price any higher. So people say, you know, all you old guys, you talk about the Internet bubble and things blew up. Well, this is different because a lot of the companies in the Internet bubble, they didn't earn anything. Well, guess what? Intel earned money. Cisco earned money. They were down by more than 80 percent. Microsoft was down by 60 percent. So, again, if once you start going out to once you're on your way to work and you get your shoe shine. Not that anyone does that anymore. And your shoe shine boys are saying, hey, I just bought NVIDIA. Well, then what do we want to start doing? We want to start looking at these inverse ETFs that are designed to move higher if the market moves lower. Right. So one of the things that we talk about um, in the class, in the trading class, is this. This is a very popular uh, ETF of, of, amongst our discussions. OK, because. Eventually, this whole AI thing, look, I'm not saying it's not going to be around for whatever, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. But this is just how markets work. OK, remember the pot stocks five years ago, seven years ago, the ones that were trading three, four hundred dollars a share that are now literally penny stocks. I mean, I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen to these AI guys because they actually earn money and so forth. But eventually, if there is a shakeout and the stocks start to move lower. Well, guess what? Here's a great way to get exposure. This is an ETF that's designed to move in the inverse way by three times as much. A lot of our students, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to give a recommendation, but I will tell you something that it's been kind of a theme that we've been kind of talking about. Like, all right, well, if this stuff starts to come apart, um, what's the best way to to profit from it? And so a lot of our students are thinking about buying long term, not long term, long term, but, you know, out maybe four or five months uh, out of the money calls on this, because, I mean, if NVIDIA and so forth start to roll over and break down, this thing is going to skyrocket. So not only is it three times leveraged, some of our students who are options traders are actually thinking or have been buying out, out of the money call options on this. So I just think the interesting thing to like, if there's one thing to take away from today's meeting here is that just understanding that you can get exposure to all of these different things that a lot of people don't even really know exist. I mean, we talked about the single stocks, the international India, India, I guess has been kind of consolidating, but the, uh, India has done very well. We got our cloud computing, global clean energy. So let's see what that looks like. A lot of these uh, global, I mean, sorry, these green, green energy companies are really just kind of falling apart. Um, emerging markets, Mexico, MEXX. Let's look. Now, I firmly believe that if you look at pretty much any chart, you can see lessons. All right. So let's just think about this real quick here. What do we see here? Remember, we talked about this before in the financials. When we get to a level that had been resistance before, we tend to run into resistance because there's people who bought up here who are going to be trying to get out over here at break even. OK, and then. Sometimes some of the people that want to sell start to sense, well, wait a second here. This ain't going my way. Uh, there's other sellers coming into the market. I better reduce the price I'm willing to sell at. And they start undercutting each other. Now, just to review, the financial sector, okay, is at a level that was a former top. 
this means there's a good chance there's going to, well, there actually has been resistance. I mean, that's a given. There's a good chance there's going to be a little bit of follow through here that Friday's reversal is going to have a little bit of legs. So what do you do? Do you just say, oh, I'm going to go hide my head in the sand? I'm going to go pretend it's not going to happen? Or do you say, you know what? They told me about that FAS ETF. This thing is going to go down. See, look at this. Notice up 3.8%. And notice down 1.1%. So if financials go down, this is going to go up. All right. By, and it's leveraged by about three times as much. So this is a great way to get exposure if there is a sell-off of financials. I, I think there is a, there's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> no comment on that one, boy. <laughs> so how about those Yukon Huskies, all right? Don't hate me because I live in Connecticut. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you haven't picked for your, uh, your, your bracket. Yeah, I pick them every year, so. I mean, last year was the right year to pick them. We'll see if uh, see if they can do it two times in a row. <laughs> it's very surreal, man. I graduated UConn in 1992, and now my daughter is up there. And I brought her up there for the college tour or whatever they call it. You know, I haven't been there in 30 years. So talk about, like, surreal. And some of the parts of the campus are the exact same. They haven't changed at all. But some of them are, like, because of the basketball, it's brought in all this money. There's all these, like, new buildings going up. And so forth. Oh, this is a um, also too. We sorry, I wanted to get into some of these industries here. Now, remember, there's a sector and there's an industry. The S and P 500 has 11 sectors. Those sectors have industries within them. For example, there's the healthcare sector. Okay, here we see the pharmaceutical and medical. This is part of the biotech industry, or maybe it's even its own industry. Um, but we got regional banks, all right? DPST. Retailers, right? The retail uh, retailer. So I would presume this is, well, I mean, obviously it's retailers. Yeah, it's got, concentrated names like, uh, like uh, actually Tesla is one of the largest uh, in that, uh, in that um space which is funny because you might not think a traditional retailer um you know would be uh tesla um oh yeah, excuse me I'm, sorry. I'm, all... I'm talking about consumer uh consumer discretionary uh, i apologize that's not the retail <laughs> yeah no it's uh, like what, what most people don't realize is most big tech isn't actually big tech okay like like amazon and tesla are consumer discretionary uh google and facebook are communication services so they're not technically in the tech sector but um we have some students we have a couple of students that are really sharp uh biotech traders and one of them is uh, actually a nurse and she's got her finger on the pulse of a lot of the the new you know, whatever the drugs or the research or so forth i mean i'm not saying she's like giving us like inside information or anything like that but it's like she gave us a lot of insight into the whole, um, do all the weight loss drugs. I mean, they've been doing, you know, printing money on that because she saw it coming a year ago. Uzembic or whatever they're, Manjora or whatever they're called. But if you're trading biotech and you think, hey, biotech's going to head higher, well, you can use this leverage DTF. If you think, hey, biotech's going to trend lower, well, you got lab. See, even I can figure this one out. Lab U for lab up, lab D for lab down. Yeah, we usually, uh, with a lot of our tickers, you'll see L at the end um, or S. So long for, you know, going long, uh, short for going short, like example, TCL, that's our triple leverage long, TCS, triple leverage short off of technology select sector. Um, or you'll see U and D a lot of times as well, up, down. Um, we, we try to make it, you know, very clear. Um, so any traders are not getting, you know, mixing up their, uh, you know, their symbols uh, on a view they're looking to take. Yeah, as a trader, that's like your ultimate nightmare is pressing <laughs> the wrong button. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely, I mean, um, one of the most recent ETFs we launched was um, QQQU, QQQD, um, which... Um, 
that is we just launched it um that's our concentrated uh uh cues etf so it's gonna be the top seven market cap weighted names and i'm sure yeah you're not gonna get a lot of uh a lot of uh, recent data on this because we uh, launched it within the past month. Um, but uh, it's a way for traders, uh, the QQQU, which is uh, the concentrated tech long, it's a uh, 2X uh, bull fund. Um, and it's uh, taking the top seven market cap weight names within the NASDAQ 100, hence you know, why we're, um, you know, the symbol is using the Qs um, and as, probably most of you can guess um that is the magnificent seven or you know <laughs> including tesla so you know magnificent six plus tesla uh, but we'll leave it in there for that um but uh we have the long side uh 2x we just launched it um equal weight across all seven names and then uh we have uh qqqd uh which is a single inverse off of that same um that same uh, index. So yeah, again, they were launched the same time about a month ago, not too much chart data, but um, a new way to trade, um, you know, concentrated tech and really the concentrated NASDAQ 100 of, the, of those you know, top seven names within the NASDAQ 100. Um, so you know, so Elliot, how do you all decide what to launch? Is it based on what people ask for? Or is it just based on what is, you know, what's really going on in the market to like who ultimately says, "Hey, here's what we're going to offer." Yeah, no, we uh, we have a product team. Um, our team works, uh, you know, pretty consistently with our product team, um, and and we're looking to provide, um, you know, for most of the ETFs we're providing, we're providing the bull and the bear side, so long and short side um, for traders, so they can have you know take either side of the view, um, you know, of that of specific you know index. Um, but it really comes down to, you know, where investor demand is, um, you know, where, uh, you know, we see, um, you know, interest in, um, you know, in areas to, to trade. So that can be a mixture of, you know, if there's a lot of volatility in a certain area, um, and then you have the concentrated cues, you know, a way instead of trading the entire NASDAQ 100, um, a way to trade, you know, just to concentrate those top names because, those top seven names make up over 60% approximately of the NASDAQ 100. Um, so they're already pretty dominant within the, the you know, full 100, um, but we are looking to provide a different way, more concentrated um, you know, exposure for traders to uh, short-term trade. Um, you know, the NASDAQ 100 just in a concentrated way. Well, let's look, take a look at some of those companies because I think there's going to be some trade ideas here. Now, let's, I guess we'll just start with Apple. So remember we talked about the ascending triangle pattern in oil? Well, this is the opposite. This is where the buyers are chill. The sellers are getting aggressive. The classic descending triangle pattern. Think about it. Chill buyers, aggressive sellers just sets the stage for the price to go lower. Now, we drop down here. They tend to find support at levels that have been support before. As a matter of fact, look how close Apple got. So support is this large group of buyers. Some of the buyers might start to say, hey, wait a second here. This thing was going down. Now it's not going down anymore. That must mean there's new buyers coming into the market. Markets only go down if there's not enough demand to absorb supply. So if they stop going down, you can assume, well, there's enough demand now. Either buyers are coming into the market. So if we're going to get a bounce there, yeah, sure, you could trade Apple, but you could also go back to the single stock ETF up here, all right? I mean, you're going to get a 50, if you're, again, remember, this is more short-term oriented because of what Ellie explained before with the uh, with the fees, and, or not the fees, but the way that things are structured. But regardless, if you think Apple is going to bounce, isn't it just kind of self-evident that like, hey, well, why don't you just buy this instead of buying Apple? You know, I mean, it's going to move by more. So that's an interesting thing to watch there for Apple. Let's see what Tesla has been doing. Yeah, so Tesla, now, here's some one of the things that we picked up on in the class that I know some of our students made, made money off of. Notice how there's support here, okay? Well, guess what? A lot of times when there's a support level and it eventually gets broken, meaning the price goes lower, it tells us that, guess what? 
the buyers who created the support have left the market. But some of the buyers are like, wow, this sucks. You know, I, I bought my position and now I'm underwater. I want to get out at break even. So if it gets back to my price, I'm going to try to sell. So remorseful buyers placing sell orders at the level that was support can turn it into resistance. So going to sell off of a little bit of resistance here, Tesla? Well, this is an example where you would use the uh, potential Tesla bear ETF. If you're not someone who trades, uh, and you know what, even if you're someone who does trade options, maybe you could buy options on this. But there are ways to make money if the market is going lower. So let's take a look at Amazon. Now, remember what I said before, like most, the best traders kind of let the market tell them what to do. When I look at something like this, it's just like, I don't really see anything there. Kind of in the middle of a range, momentum's kind of neutral. You know, look at something like Apple. It's like, wait a second. We're toying with this important support level here. There might be something going on there. So it's just a matter of letting the market tell you what to do, not trying to force the idea. A lot of newer traders feel like they always need to be doing something. Okay. And that leads to over trading, which leads to people losing money. One of the things that we talk about in our class is, well, I mean, we talk about it all the time actually is psychology. All right. And the markets have changed. The technology has changed, but we can look at charts from the 1800s and you can see the same patterns that we see now. And it's because human nature has not changed. So, one of the things that we do is we, we kind of review or study these people that have been these great traders over, at least in our history, going back to the revolution. And they all say the same thing. I mean, you could read Paul Tudor Jones, who is this, you know, epic hedge fund manager who is, as far as I know, is still very active. And I'm paraphrasing, but one of the things he said is, hey, one of the reasons why I was able to make so much money is because I knew when to stay off, stay out of the market. I knew when to stay on the sidelines. All right. Jesse Livermore, that error's version of a hedge fund trader of 1920s, basically says the same thing. He says, I didn't make my money by being in the market. I made my money by being out of the market. And I think what he meant was that he's got the self-discipline to be okay with being on the sidelines until he sees something like this come along. And I mean, what I mean here is like there could be a potential trade error with Apple, right? Could have a little bit of a rally here. Um, so it's letting the market tell you what to do as opposed to just kind of coming in and be like, all right, well, guess what? I'm going to buy this or I'm going to sell that. You know, it's like, well, why? <laughs> I own Apple long term. I don't trade it. Well, that's probably a very good strategy. At least it has been for the last 30 some odd years. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, all right, so let's go, let's go take a look at gold and then let's look at the, uh, the J nug or the dust or so forth. All right. So gold futures, I think this is a really good example. Well, I know this is a really good example of market memory. Remember we talked before about how like levels that are important can retain their importance for a long time. Well, here's gold. Now let's think about, you got this enormous market, you know, it's, almost it's like mind boggling if you think about all the gold that's going on in the world there's miners there's this there's that there's jewelry it's a worldwide market so way back here in august of 20 we get up here to about two thousand eighty five dollars and then we peak guess what market memory here we are in march of 22 we literally get within a couple dollars a couple of dollars. Think about that. This is a two thousand and eighty-five dollars security, and we got within a couple of dollars. I mean, that is like you'd have to like round out to like the sixth or seventh decimal to see how close that was. Guess what? Here we go. Fast forward in time. Here we are in May of last year. Where did we find resistance? Two thousand and eighty-five. All right. Fast forward again. Where did we find resistance in December? Where did we find resistance in late December? Where did we find resistance in February? 
So it's all about knowing where these levels are. Now, gold seems to be kind of consolidating a little bit here. It's probably going to be some profit taking. One of the reasons why we get support is because we have remorseful sellers trying to buy their securities back. Someone sells, the price goes higher, and they say, ah, if I could, I made a mistake. If I could get back whatever I sold at the same price, um, if I could buy it back at the same price I sold it at, I'm going to. So you can even see that, that, like right here, this is why we get a level that was resistance turns into support. So now, if to me, this action on gold looks pretty volatile. I mean, I think there's probably going to be some follow through here. I mean, these are some big reversals. So if we start to get close down to this 2085 level, remember, levels of our resistance can become support. Markets tend to rally off of support. So there could be a trade right here. Now, you're not someone who trades gold futures. You don't want to have a, someone bring a bunch of gold to your house. Well, hmm. now we can look at the NUGT, the dust, JNUG, JDUST. So there's just so many. It's just really an incredible world. I mean, when I first came onto Wall Street back in the 90s, ETFs literally didn't even exist. I mean, I remember when they first got started. And now you have these things that just offer, I, I mean, you could build an entire strategy based around just just these ETFs here. I mean, it's really amazing. Yeah, and interesting uh, <clears throat> around the gold, um, you know, we've seen, you know, we saw it break through when you're showing that chart, um, you know, all time highs uh, back. Uh, I think it was on Wednesday after the uh, the Fed, uh, the Fed meeting. And um, and, you know, we've seen a pretty strong rally in gold in general, um, you know, throughout the year, some volatility. The gold miners, again, you know, these are equities. It's not gold, but you know they are impacted by the price of gold and where gold is going. Uh, the gold mining stocks uh, were a little bit later to uh, the rally. Uh, they lagged uh, gold, um, you know, in the start of it, and were kind of uh, playing a little catch up. Um, so, you know, definitely something to to note there. Um, but it's interesting to see that play out over the past month. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Um, so, so just in going back to the thought of letting the market tell you what to do. Well, would I do anything on gold right here? Eh, probably not. But if gold starts getting down to around here, that's where I'm going to get interested. And I, I don't want a bunch of gold in my house. I mean, I guess it would be great if the, you know, the world comes to an end. Then again, if the world comes to an end, I don't think anyone's going to care about gold, <laughs> but, uh, but it's just so much easier to you see these commercials on some of these financial networks where it's people talk about like, you know, getting gold in their house because they like to hold it and so forth. I mean, that's that's great if that's your thing. But you're going to get you're going to if you're on the right side, you're going to make way more money off of these guys wherever they, they went there. The, the J Nug, you're going to make way more money. Um then if you're just getting exposure to gold. So it's, it's just, I, I just think the, I, one of the things I want you to take away from this is just, just knowing this stuff is there. You know what I mean? It's really just that simple. Like knowing this is there. Oh, I think that, you know, this really isn't good. Oil is moving a lot higher. My gas prices are going up. What am I going to do? Well, you don't need to be a sophisticated trader. You could just say, you know what? I'm just going to hedge myself. I'm going to throw some of this into my portfolio. So maybe I spend an extra thousand dollars a month on my oil bill. But if oil is moving higher, there's something in my portfolio that's going to move higher as well. So it's almost like a hedge. All right. Well, actually, it is a hedge. It's like, all right, well, I got to pay a bigger check for my oil bill, but my portfolio is growing the same amount. So it becomes like a wash. <laughs> yes, hit the like, Tony. Teeny pie. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, let's just look at a couple of these. So you can consumer discretionary arrows. Oh, you know what I wanted to look at? Um, so FedEx had this really big move on their earnings, okay? So kind of too soon to tell which way this is going to go. It might break back below remember we talked about their support of former resistance levels 
but the earnings looked really good. I mean, they're really improving their profit margins. They actually had less revenue, but way better earnings. And that's because the operating margin got better. So now if this starts to move higher, guess what? It's going to move the industry higher. And I know that there is a transportation one in here. Yeah, TPOR. Yep, yeah. So there could be your play there. It's like, well, you know, I kind of like FedEx. The numbers were good. I think this is going to move higher. Well, if FedEx move higher, there's a really good chance that that's going to bring the entire industry higher. And then instead of buying FedEx, you could get exposure over here to the TPOR. Oh, wow. You guys got the utilities, utilities too. Yeah, no, we cover uh, pretty much, uh, you know, I don't want to say every sector, but uh, we have all the gig sectors, the sub sectors, um, you know, as you mentioned, country specific, um, you know, and kind of across the whole gamut of, uh, you know, uh, ways to trade, um, you know, different exposures. Um, that's something that you know, we really tried to, um, you know, provide to our uh, clients and, and short term traders that are using uh, these ETFs um, is, you know, uh, different ways to, to trade. Um, you know, we're as a, a firm agnostic. We don't really take views um, because, you know, we have, you know, the traders are the ones that are you know, taking their short term you know, tactical views, um, you know, with the products that we're offering. Um, you know, as you see, we offer both both uh, sides of the you know the trade uh, for most of the indices that we cover. One of the one of the things I think people really take for granted about markets is just how important the psychology is. All right, now think about it. I know this seems kind of self evident, but it's actually pretty profound. For every seller, there's a buyer. Every time you sell a stock, well, well, I mean, it could be a stock, it could be a crypto, it could be an ETF, but let's just stick with stocks. If you sell a stock, guess what? You're like, whoever is going to buy this from me is a sucker. You know, this thing is going lower. Yeah, okay. It's trading at 284. Here, take it. Take all you want. Blah, blah, blah. Get rid of it. The person who's buying it from you is like, this guy is a fool. This thing is going higher. I'll, I'll buy all they, all they have. So every single trade, there's a buyer and a seller. So every single trade, it just shows you how varied the opinions are. One of what my students asked me, what seems like a pretty simple question, but it's actually really profound. Like, what is the actual value of a stock? You know, what is the actual value of FedEx? All right. Well, as a trader, I would say, well, it's trading at 284. That's what it's worth. It's the most anyone's going to pay you for. It. You know, a value manager might go and do their analysis and say, I think this stock is worth 310. Uh, the market is discounted. I'm going to go buy it. A short seller might say, you know what? I think you're completely wrong. I think this whole thing with the margins is just a, a fluke and it's going to revert. I think this stock is worth 250. All right. So the person who thinks it's worth 300 will gladly sell it to the person who thinks it's worth 250 and vice versa. Because the person who thinks it's worth 250 is like, oh, you're a sucker. And the person who thinks it's 300 is like, oh, you're a seller, you're a sucker. But everything in the market is about psychology. And if you could understand supply and demand, you can understand how to read these charts. And I think one of the great things about these uh, ETFs is it gives you the way to kind of go both ways, right? All right, I think that China market's going to go higher uh, until it gets to this resistance level. Okay, great. You buy it, it gets to the resistance. I know that things tend to reverse off of resistance. That's what Mark keeps telling me. All right, I'm going to jump in on the other side of the trade here. And as a trader, I can tell you, personal experience, there's no greater feeling ever than getting something both ways. In other words, you buy it, it gets to your target, and then you go on the other side, and you go short, and you take it down. But you got the yin and the yang. Um, we've discussed the energy. Uh, ETFs. I love this want. <laughs> it's want. It's got to be consumer discretionary as opposed yeah. to there's want and there's need. Right? Yeah, that would be the uh, consumer staples. Consumer staples. That's pretty funny. FDX looks like a bearish abandoned baby. Well, 
I now as a trader, I think there's going to be a move here. All right. Down, up. I don't know. And I know that's kind of sounds like a cop out. A lot of my friends are like, oh, you traders are all the same. It might go this way. It might go that way. Well, I think the odds are greater that it's going to do that or that than it does that. Most of the time when something gets to an important price level, it doesn't tend to stay there for too long. It's like it's analogous to like if you're hiking in the woods and you come to like a fork in the trail. It They tend to go one way or the other. They tend not to kind of just hang out there. So, so this is something on Monday I'm going to have my eye on. All right. I mean, my guess is it's probably going to move lower. And break the support but again but i don't know i don't want to make a prediction i want to be a reactionary um when i used to trade for steve cohen who's potentially the greatest trader who's ever lived at least in our era you know this guy was amazing he would come in and it would be like in the pre-market all right let's buy a million i did the over-the-counter equities um so it's like all right let's buy a million shares of intel let's buy a million shares of microsoft let's buy a million shares of dell let's buy a million shares of cisco whatever it was. And then like 932 after the market opens, he sees something and it's like, oh, sell, sell, sell. What the hell was I thinking? You know, so it's that ability to just kind of react to the market as opposed to a lot of traders. Their problem goes back to the psychology in trading parlance. We would say, oh, they're married to that idea. Well, these stocks are not your friends, right? They don't really care about you. So you shouldn't really care about them. <laughs> One of the biggest problems people have is something that we call, um, well, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a sentiment thing. And and this happens a lot in bubbles. Someone buys a stock, let's just say, hypothetically speaking, $10. And it goes to 20 and it goes to 30 and it goes to 50 And then they're like, wow, this is the easiest money I've ever made. I, I, I made more money than I did in the last five years and I didn't even need to get out of bed. I love this stock. This stock is my friend. I'm never going to get rid of this stock. So it gets to 100. Great. Then it gets to 90. Well, you know, down 10%, but eh, I, I'm still way up. Gets down to 80. Well, you know, it's whatever. It's going to come back. It's going to come back. Gets to 70. So forth and so on. I mean, I this is something I get in our trading school a lot. These people, they... They fall in love with an idea. They become emotionally invested in it. And emotions and trading generally are not a good thing to, uh, you know, they're not a good match there. So that's the sentimentality bias. It's like, oh, this is my friend. Everyone knows about, yeah, all right. Everyone has, um, knows someone who's like, it's friends that are in this relationship that shouldn't be together. You know, and it's like everyone could kind of see it. But, you know, maybe the first couple of dates, they had like a really good time and then they ended up, you know, fighting a lot or whatever. But they still want to like try to retain the glory and let's hope we can go on that first or second date again. And it's the same thing with like a stock. Like people just get emotionally attached to it and it starts going down. And it's like, well, if I was logical, I would cut this thing off here. I, I'd send them the pink slip, right? I'm out. But, Oh, it's my friend. It's good. It's everything's going to be okay. It's all going to turn around. Remember, it's all psychology. This stock last traded on 284.32 on Friday. Why did someone sell it there? Well, they think it's going down. Why did someone buy it there? Well, they think it's going up. Who's right? Only time will tell. But I just think it's really a. I just. <laughs> there it comes. <laughs> hey, you know, it's true. I mean, I. You know, it's true. And this is one of the reasons why in a, in a trading environment, we want to use what we call like a trailing stop. OK, which is a really essential part of a trading uh, strategy. And that basically means if something is going your way and you got money on the table, if it reverses, how are you going to get out? What's your strategy for getting out? Most people use um, percentages oh, if it reverses by X percent. Now, this is, I'm going to show you right here. This is, um, obviously, we've gapped up since then. But just pretend we're right here. Now, all right, I bought FedEx. Uh, I bought FedEx 
around 250, I think it's going to 300. That's my target, $300. This thing gets up to 300, I'm going to sell, okay? Now, I buy it and it starts going my way and I got some money on the table there. All right, bought it around 250, now it's at 260. Now, what is the uh, trailing stop? Okay, if it reverses by X percent, if it reverses by a couple dollars, if it breaks a trend line, I like to use trend lines with my reversal strategies. Okay, guess what? So you thought it was, you said it was going to go to 300. You were wrong. It reversed. It didn't get there. You were wrong. Okay, admit it. You thought it was going to 300. It didn't. But because of your trailing stop, your exit strategy is going to be like, if we cross back above this trend line, that's where I'm going to sell and get out. So even though we were wrong, it didn't get to 300. Having the trailing stop allows you to keep your some of your profits. You're not going to get the exact top, but trading is not about being precise. I tell people, think about, you know, you UConn basketball, right? The best teams are going to miss some shots. No one is precise and no one is perfect. So trading is not about being right. It's about making money. So here's an example where you could be completely wrong. Oh, I thought it was going to get to 300 and I was wrong. But because I had a proper uh, risk management strategy or, or a trailing stop strategy, I got to keep some money on the table here. So you know what? Did I get the top price? No. Who the hell cares? My The value of my account grew today. And that's the only thing as a trader you should really focus on. How much equity did you have in your account in the morning and how much did you have in the afternoon? And if it's bigger, you did a good job. If it's not, you should ask yourself, what the hell am I doing wrong? And I tell a lot of my students, if you really focus just on your equity, it's going to help you. It's going to remind you like what you really are doing here. You're not here to say, oh, this is this pattern. This is that pattern. You're here to make money. You're not here to be precise. No one can. The greatest traders in the history of the world can't buy at the top or sell at the or sell the top and buy at the bottom. There's an old expression on Wall Street. The only people that can sell at the top and buy at the bottom are, are liars. So it's about being right. Um, so anyway, going back to why we're here with this uh, these ETFs, this having a knowledge of these things can really give you the ability to like kind of switch back and forth. Like we talked about the financials. If we break down, all right, well, you can go to the fast. Let's just say it looks like turns out that that resistance is going to break and the market's going to keep moving higher. Well, then you could go over here to the fast F A S. So, so there's important to know that you just have all of these options out there. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, we do have a, a lot of products uh, to choose from. Uh, to be honest, it can be overwhelming. I work with, uh, you know, these products every day and, you know, I uh, I know um, most of them by heart, but uh, there, there are a lot out there uh, for sure um, and different ways to trade, you know, different types of exposure, um, more concentrated, less concentrated. What, what is the typical question you get from one of your institutional clients? Um, you know, we, we get asked, um, you know, where we've seen, um, you know, where the largest flows, inflows, outflows, um, you know, asking for types of exposure. So, you know, what I kind of just mentioned of, you know, what's going on, um, you know, if they're looking for, say, technology exposure, but they want to go a little bit more concentrated, um, you know, how they can best, you know, what exposure through one of our ETFs will get them, you know, the best exposure that they're looking for. Um, if we don't have the exact index that they're looking to trade, um, you know, what ETF of ours will, you know, provide, um, you know, exposure that is you know, most relevant to what they're looking to do for their ideas. Um, and, you know, we also get uh, questions on, you know, liquidity, um, but, you know, most of our ETFs are, you know, some of the most heavily traded ETFs on a daily basis um, from a volume standpoint. Um, and, you know, the underlying uh, of all of our ETFs are very liquid. Um, you know, we don't launch an ETF 
that we wouldn't be able to gain, you know, a daily 2x, 3x, or, you know, inverse 2x or inverse 3x daily exposure to. Um, so uh, it, it really depends. Um, you know, we send out, um, you know, capital market morning updates, um, you know, what's going on in the suite, our ETFs. Um, it really depends on the client and, you know, how they're trading. Yeah, that's cool. It makes sense. Um, all right. So let's just, uh, I'm just going to pick a random one here and I'm just going to see if we can do a little bit of it. Oh, look at that. Nell. Oh, I like that. Yeah, the home builders. Oh, these stuff going on in home builders. I'm in. All right. So, so we can just look at some of our simple market principles here. What we, we saw before some of our other, other things. Notice how here, okay, the level that was resistance becomes support. Now, when this market is selling off and you're thinking, you know, I really like this thing, but it's going lower. Where should I buy it? Well, you don't want to just guess because you might get run over or you might miss it. This might be on its way down and you might say, all right, well, it's at 130, it's at 125. If it gets to 115, I'm going to buy it. Well, guess what? You were right because you thought it was going to rally, but you didn't read the market. If you looked at the market, the market would have said, hey, pay attention. There is resistance around this 119 level. We know that there tends to be support at levels that had been resistance. So instead of me just guessing, I'm going to buy it if it gets down to 115, I'm going to say, you know what? It's probably a good chance there's going to be support here. So this is a good example of letting the market tell you what to do. Remember, the best traders, they let the market tell them what to do. They don't come in... I like to, I I love to tell people this right. An opinion is a very dangerous thing for a trader to have. Now it's fun to talk like, oh, I think the market's going to go up. I think the market's going to do that. But going back to our psychology, when you say you start to tell all your trading friends, oh, S and P is going to go up. S and P is going to go up. S and P is going to go. Blah 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 blah. Well, this might make you subject to confirmation bias, like we talked about before about the sense of mentality bias. The confirmation bias might be like, you know, and you might not even realize it's happening, but it's going to make you not give enough attention to things that might be contrary to your opinion. And you may not even realize you're doing it. So if you're a short term prop trader, which most of our students are, it's very dangerous to have an opinion because you know what? You're wrong. I'm wrong. Steve Cohen's wrong. Podar Jones is wrong. A lot of times, you know, it's never wrong as the market. Yeah, and you know, um, I know we're we're getting closer on on time here. And one thing I just wanted to say, uh, you know, to everybody that has uh, you know joined us today, um, you know, with leverage and inverse ETFs, they are short term. Um, you know, they are important. And yep, that's exactly the slide I was uh, looking to go to. Um, and we do have, we really prioritize our, our uh, education um, around these and just making sure that anybody that is using them and doesn't fully understand them, or more importantly, someone that hasn't used uh, a leverage ETF. And, you know, we want to make sure that they understand how they work. We have uh, some great short term, um, you know, uh, short term videos, short videos, uh, overview videos and uh, educational content that kind of uh, describe, you know, what I mentioned today about the daily rebounds with leverage, um, you know, and, you know, why trend is your friend in these products and why they're really, they're not meant for everybody. Um, you know, you have to have the risk appetite um, and we want to make sure you understand the potential risks with them and why they're really short-term trading tools. So definitely, uh, you know, head over to our website direction.com um, our leverage and inverse education section. Um, if you want to learn, you know, more about these uh, products and, you know, uh, how they work. Um, just wanted to definitely say that, um, you know, before, um, you know, we, we hopped off today. <laughs> All right. Great. Thanks, Elliot. It was very, uh, very informational. I learned a bunch of new things today. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, Mark, I really appreciate the time and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, everybody they, uh, that attended, uh, you know, learned a little bit more, 
um, whether it's just, uh, you know, about leverage uh, and inverse CTFs, you know, about, um, you know, different trading uh, styles and, you know, opportunities. Um, and I really appreciate you having me on today. Yeah, my pleasure. And let's do it again soon. Sounds great. Sounds great. Well, uh, uh, good luck with uh, your Huskies today. I think they're playing today. <laughs> tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Yes. They, they only won by 40 yesterday, so we got to wait till tomorrow. <laughs> Ride comes before the fall, right? So. But cool. Yeah, thanks, Elliot. It was great talking yeah. to you. Thank you so much.